So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And as mentioned today, I'd like to um, show you or present you some results from recent phase one studies on effects, dosing, interactions on, of classic psychedelics and how these findings could potentially um, have implications for planning on future phase two studies or also clinical applications. First, I have no conflict of interest to declare. So here you can see the structure of these so-called classic psychedelics, including LSD, DMT, psilocybin, and mescaline. And you can see that these all show at least a partial structural similarity to serotonin. And all these substances are thought to primarily act as a partial agonist on the serotonin 2A receptor. Nevertheless, all these substances also display a partly uh, distinct pharmacological profile with affinities to various other receptors or transporters, which also could um, might contribute to different um, effects. So classic psychedelics have been used for a long time for spiritual and ethnomedical purposes and use or being used as recreational drugs but there is renewed interest in using those drugs as adjunct to psychotherapy for several psychiatric disorders but also for um, the treatment of some somatic disorders psychedelics are thought to exhibit low somatic safety concerns and concerns um, are more about psychological issues. So as you are all aware of, psychedelics are experiencing a renaissance and clinical trials, uh, mainly investigating MDMA, but also psilocybin and to a lesser extent LSD are increasing exponentially, which also reflects on the number of publications that are being mentioned on PubMed. So why do we still need phase one studies then? Um, psychedelic drug development programs are subject to standards and regulations or same standards and regulations as any other drug development program for approval and earlier studies were mostly lacking nowadays research standards. So psychedelics still need to be adequately characterized in vitro and in vivo, including basic information on dosing, distinction, um, pharmacokinetics, dose response relationships, and potential drug-drug interactions, as is evidenced by the recently released FDA draft guidance on clinical trials with psychedelics. So su such studies are essential to support the optimal design of further clinical studies of psychedelics, as is also emphasized on a recently published CPT editorial. So now, how do classic psychedelics differ from other psychoactive substance um, classes? To address this question, we administered a high dose of the prototypical antactogen MDMA, a high dose of the prototypical stimulant amphetamine, and a moderate dose of LSD to healthy participants. Here we can see the acute subjective effects over time, which are measured on so-called visual analog scales, which are 10 centimeter long lines, which are marked with not at all on the left and extreme on the right. And participants have to rate their effects over time on these scales. So here we can see that LSD, even at this uh, moderate dosage, in produced overall more pronounced acute subjective drug effects 
induced mostly good drug effects, but also increased bad drug effects, which are, of course, relatively few compared with this overall mostly positive experienced drug effects. However, what seems a unique and most important feature of the psychedelics, or here LSD, is the ego douche solution here shown on the panel um, on the left bottom. And you see that MDMA slightly increased ego dissolution, but LSD led to a much more pronounced increase of ego dissolution. So, however, what is even more important is that LSD produced complex alterations of waking consciousness. Um, this is reflected here on this 5D ASC scale. This is a widely used questionnaire um, to assess altered states of waking consciousness. We see that LSD mostly, sorry, mostly induced perceptual alterations, including visual hallucinations and audiovisual synesthesia, but also produced positively experienced derealization and depersonalization phenomena and deeply felt positive mood, but also increased, increased however, to a much lesser extent negative effects such as anxiety. On this scale, MDMA only induced blissful state and amphetamine did not increase any scores on any of these dimensions. So taken together, LSD shows clearly different, overall more pronounced and complex um, alterations of waking consciousness than those other two substance classes. So now we've seen how LSD, or the prototypical psychedelic LSD, differs from other psychoactive substance classes. However, a widely debated question is whether classic psychedelics differ in, term of, in terms of their acute subjective effects, and if they do not differ, whether it's possible to determine um, those equivalences. To address this question, we directly compared mescaline, psilocybin, and LSD in 32 healthy subjects. All of these subjects received LSD at a dose of 100 microgram and psilocybin at a dose of 20 milligram. And the dose um, of mescaline was first 300 milligram, but was increased after 16 participants to 500 milligrams after it became clear that this dose was considered too low or was producing lower effects than the other drug substances at those dosages. What we can see now is, as mentioned, um, 300 milligram of mescaline showed less pronounced subjective effects, but the high dose of mescaline and LSD at this dose of 100 microgram and 20 milligram of psilocybin all induced um, similar um, alteration or in peak induced peak effects on ratings of any drug effect, similarly produced good drug effects and all only produced also, again, very few bad drug, drug effects. Most importantly, again, all three substances produce comparable peak um, alterations of ego dissolution. And what we can see here is well that the effects of LSD and psilocybin start um, or start to peak sooner than mescaline effects does, um, and mescaline shows a much longer duration than those other two substances. On the 5D ASC scale, again, we could see that this dose of 300 milligrams of mescaline produced overall lower alterations of consciousness, but the high dose of mescaline, LSD, and psilocybin produced no qualitative differences in altered, altered states of consciousness. 
Similarly, as we observed for LSD, mescaline at this dosage and psilocybin also mainly induce perceptual alteration, followed by this positively experienced um, um, phenomena. And interestingly, none of the substances at those dosages used produce significant anxiety compared to placebo. So the Overall subjective effects at a dose of 500 milligram mescaline, um, psilocybin 20 milligram and LSD 100 microgram were comparable and potential differences in those, in those effects of those substances or on alterations of mind are rather dose dependent than substance dependent. All three substances produced moderate increases in blood pressure and um, body temperature. Only psilocybin increased blood pressure significantly more than LSD did, whereas LSD showed a trend to increase heart rate more compared to placebo. However, overall, um, cardiovascular stimulation was similar as observed here with the rate pressure product. However, we expected that mescaline would have higher cardiovascular stimulation due to its additional activity at, at adrenergic receptors. This could not be shown here. Overall, these um, autonomic effects were moderate and transient, so also supporting a favorable somatic safety profile of the psychedelics. Side effects were comparable between all three substances and included mostly headache, um, lack of energy and concentration, nausea, inattention and restlessness, loss of appetite and dry mouth, consistent with sympathomimetic and serotonergic stimulation. Only mescaline showed more side effects after 12 hours, consistent with its longer duration. However, we have to keep in mind that um, those side effects shown here for mescaline are for the lower and for the higher dose um, combined. And if we have a closer look, it seems that mescaline seems to induce more nausea than those other two substances. Here, again, you can see the visual analog scale of this study measuring nausea. And we see that nausea was more prominent following both dosages of mescaline than for the other substances. We recently completed a um, mescaline dose response study where participants received 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, 400 milligrams, and 800 milligrams of mescaline. And we can see that nausea, self reported nausea, was also dose dependent and increased with higher dosages. Not only self-reported nausea was more prominent at higher doses, but also emesis was more prominent at higher dosages and at the higher do highest dosage of 800 milligrams of mescaline, almost half of the subjects were vomiting two hours after administration of the drug, which clearly limits is its use in clinical practice. So overall, it seems that um, Mescaline 500 milligram, LSD 100 micrograms, and psilocybin 20 milligram produce similar subjective effects and similar alterations of consciousness, whereas tolerability might be worse for mescaline, but a clear distinction can be observed for the effect duration. All substances show a similar time to onset, but mescaline is delayed by uh, to reach the, t uh, the maxima subjective effects. These occur uh, between around two hours for LSD and psilocybin, 
and mescaline peak subjective effects are only um, reached between three to four hours. As expected, psilocybin showed the, sh the shortest effect duration here at the associates with a mean of 4.9 hours, followed by LSD with a mean of 8.2 hours, and mescaline clearly showed the longest duration of effects with 11 hours. So another disadvantage to use this substance in clinics. Now, let's have a look at the pharmacokinetics of these substances. Here we see the aforementioned mescaline dose response study. We also conducted a LSD dose response study. And here shown are pharmacokinetics of different studies um, using psilocybin at different dosages. We can see here that all three substances exhibit dose proportional uh, uh, pharmacokinetics with a linear elimination pharmacokinetics, and for all substances, no sex differences were observed. So that means that the dosages do not need to be adjusted to sex. And additionally, no correlation between plasma concentration and body weight was found for LSD and psilocybin, also supporting that the LSD and psilocybin dosages do not need to be adjusted to body weight. Preliminary analysis of mescaline showed a potential correlation between plasma concentrations and body weight, so maybe um, this needs to be adjusted, but we have to have a closer look at it first. Interestingly, uh, plasma concentration of all substances um, closely mirror subjective effects within subjects. In contrary for what we expected, mescaline shows a similar em elimination half-life compared to LSD. We expected it to much be much longer based on previous data. And so it seems that only the delay of reaching its maximal plasma concentration and maximal subjective peak effects are contributing to this longer duration of mescaline. So taken together, we've seen that um, a dose of LSD base at 100 micrograms, psilocybin 20 milligrams, and mescaline hydrochloride of 500 milligrams can be considered equivalent in terms of psychoactive effects and also autonomic stimulation. Thus, dose equivalencies um, from LSD to psilocybin is about or around 1 to 200, and uh, dose equivalency from psilocybin to mescaline which is around 1 to 25. So these results might help for future dose findings, for future studies, or also facilitate interpretation of clinical results with either substance. Now, another very important question is whether and how um, classic, psycho classic psychedelics interact with other drugs. Let's start with 5-HT2A antagonists. In the aforementioned LSD dose response study, um, participants received several different dosages of LSD, but were also pre-administered or pre-treatment with the um, 5-HC2A antagonist ketanserine. Um, this was given prior to a high dose of LSD of 200 micrograms. We see that uh, pre-treatment with ketanserine effectively prevented the LSD effects to a level of around 25 micrograms, um, and this was even more pronounced for bad drug effects and ego dissolution. What we can see here as well, that we see a dose proportional increase in effects, but it seems that there is a plateau for any drug effect any drug effect and good drug effect around um, 100 micrograms 
whereas this could not be observed for bad drug effects and ego dissolution, which further increased when the dosage was increased. So in the mescaline dose response study as well, um, the highest at the highest dosage um, level, the participants also received ketanserine. Similarly, as we've seen with LSD, also ketanserine here prevented mescaline-induced subjective effects. Also, more strongly for bad drugs effects and ego dissolution. But this is the first time that it's actually been shown that the 5-HC2A receptor also plays a crucial role in mediation of subjective effects of mescaline. Um, in contrast to what we've seen with the LSD dose response study, no ceiling effect was observed. So all the effects steadily increased um, and up to, or at least up to 800 milligrams, we could not observe any ceiling effects. So taken together, uh, there are several drugs that are known to block 5-HTA receptors, including several neuroleptics, but also some antidepressants, such as trazodone and birtazapine, which then potentially would uh, um, uh, reduce the acute effects of these psychedelics and therefore should be stopped at least five to seven days prior to treatment with LSD uh, mescaline and also for psilocybin where it has been repeatedly been shown this, uh, that its effects are blocked by 5-HC2A antagonists. Earlier case reports suggest that um, concomitant treatment with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor decreases effects of psychedelics. And up to date in clinical trials, but also in the limited use program in Switzerland, um, treatment with uh, SSRI needed to be stopped before patients were treated with an SSRI. It has repeatedly been shown that the acute psychedelic um, experience seems to influence or it seems to have an effect on therapeutic outcomes and potentially long-lasting positive treatment effects. Um, this has been shown for patients suffering from depression, anxiety, and substance use disorder. Here, shown as an example, we see a trial conducted in treatment-resistant patients, um, and we see that responders to the treatment with psilocybin defined as a 50% reduction in scores of dep or depressive symptom scores, these responders were showing higher levels of experience of unity, spiritual experience, blissful state, and insightfulness. In contrast, um, non-responders showed higher levels of anxiety. Correspondingly, um, alterations in consciousness or increased levels of oceanic boundlessness, so this positively experienced depersonalization and the um, <coughs> realization phenomena were positively correlated with the treatment effect, whereas the um, increases in threat of ego dissolution or anxious ego dissolution were inversely correlated. Hence, it seems helpful to increase or to booster those positive effects and to decrease the negative effects to achieve a better treatment outcome. So we conducted a study um, where healthy participants received or were pre-treatment over two weeks with the SSRI escitalopram or placebo in a crossover design. We see that there was no pharmacokinetic interaction, but 
pretreatment with escitalopram slightly reduced perceived drug effects. However, no changes overall in overall alterations of consciousness were observed, and in contrast to what we expected, pretreatment with escitalopram reduced anxious ego dissolution and anxiety. Additionally, what is not shown here is that escitalopram pretreatment reduced psilocybin induced increases of blood pressure and did not further increase body temperature. So these are concerns associated with serotonergic toxicity, which could not be observed in this study. Hence, it seems that SSRIs do not need to be stopped prior to psilocybin. However, these, of course, are results in um, healthy volunteers, and it might be different in patients also receiving SSRIs chronically. Nevertheless, a uh, just recently published study um, was conducted also in patients suffering from treatment-resistant depression, and they received psilocybin without, um, they, uh, without the requirement of stopping their ongoing SSRI treatment. And we see that those patients were treated chronically with a mean duration of 15 months. They also showed a good therapeutic response, and it was generally well tolerated. So that means that SSRIs do not need to be stopped prior to a treatment with psilocybin. It's not clear how it's, if it's the case also with LSD, but this is being tested right now. So what are the influences of genetic polymorphisms or interactions with CYP2D6 inhibitors. Um, already some years ago, in vitro, it could be shown that several so-called cytochrome enzymes are involved in the metabolism of LSD, including, amongst others, CYP2D6. CYP2D6 is a highly polymorphic gene um, and about 5 to 10 percent of Caucasians are expected to exhibit a non-functional variant of this gene, so-called poor metabolizers. If we assume that CYP2D6 is involved in the degradation of LSD, then we would expect in those poor metabolizers that LSD exposure or LSD plasma concentration increases. In line, in a recent pooled pharmacogenetic analysis, we could observe that, in fact, those poor CYP2D6 poor metabolizer showed increased exposure to LSD with an increased half-life of LSD and consistently increased effect duration. A similar picture was shown in a clinical trial where we um, co-administered LSD and MDMA. MDMA is a CYP2D6 inhibitor, and here also we again could see that the half-life of LSD is increased in combination with MDMA. LSD's exposure is increased, and also, similarly, the duration of effects was increased. So this results support a role of CYP2D6 in the metabolism of LSD. Therefore, a reduction of dose of LSD should be considered if you know that a patient or a participant is a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer or if patients are using a strong CYP2D6 inhibitor. So how could these findings now be applied um, in clinics, or how could we improve those response relationships? 
A recent clinical trial investigated the effects of LSD in patients suffering from anxiety with and without a life-threatening disease. In this trial, patients received two times 200 micrograms of LSD compared with placebo and a rapid and also long-lasting reduction in anxiety up to four months was observed. Similarly, as what we discussed before, positive correlations were again observed for positive effects and reductions in those anxiety scores. But additionally, here we could also observe a positive correlation between mystical type experience and reductions in anxiety scores. Overall, um, administration of LSD was considered relatively safe and mostly minor treatment related events were observed, including nausea, anxiety and headaches, so similar adverse effects as are described for healthy participants. However, one serious treatment related event should be noted. One patient experienced acute transient anxiety and delusions, which also require treatment with um, lorazepam and olanzapine, and subsequently the second dose was reduced to 100 micrograms. Again, coming back to the aforementioned results of this LSD dose response study, which was only conducted afterwards, we observed um, a dose proportional increase in plasma concentration at different dosages of LSD, but a ceiling effect for several, drug, uh, for, for several subjective effects were observed at 100 micrograms of LSD. So this was the case for mostly good drug effects and any gut drug effects, but also overall alterations of consciousness were similar at the dosage of 100 microgram and 200 microgram of LSD, and only significant increases were observed when further increasing the dosage in anxiety and in the total anxious ego dissolution scale, but also for disembodiment. So it seems that LSD exhibits a ceiling effect at around 100 microgram for mostly um, positive drug effects, whereas the ceiling effect cannot be observed for bad drug effects in anxiety. So the drug or the dosage of the drug used, uh, the 200 micrograms can be considered high and induce a full psychedelic experience, but also increase um, the risk of experiencing acute anxiety. <coughs> Therefore, in current studies, we mostly use dosages of 100 microgram LSD, as is also shown here in a schematic overview of a study that will start soon, where we assess um, effects of LSD in palliative care patients. In this study, patients will receive, or patients in the active treatment group are um, receiving first a dose of 100 micrograms of LSD, and we are using an ascending dose regimen, meaning that the second dose um, can be increased to 200 micrograms if the first dosing was well tolerated by these patients. Additionally, we will use an active placebo in this study, as is um, recommended by the FDA, and uh, patients in this active placebo group will receive two times 25 micrograms of LSD. 
25 micrograms of LSD we've seen in healthy participants um, is showing s subtle subjective effects. Therefore, we expect to enhance blinding, but it does not produce um, overall acute alterations of consciousness and does not produce mystical type experiences. So it should not affect those measures that were associated with positive treatment outcomes, which include amongst others in this population also um, scores on depressive and, and anxious symptoms. Ketanserin not only prevented, but also reversed the acute response to LSD, as is evidenced here. Um, this again underscores the importance of the 5-HC2A receptor in mediating these effects, but could also offer some practical benefits, including shortening of treatment duration, but also this drug could be administered um, when pa patients are experiencing a bad trip as a rescue treatment. Despite its relatively um, good safety profile, broader use of psychedelics, including LSD, uh, might potentially lead to more psychological adverse reactions to psychedelics. Hence, we need to know about drugs that are able to stop or help in the situations of psych psychedelic associated distress. Therefore, we will also soon start a study um, in healthy participants where we will directly compare the effects of ketanserin, but also lorazepam and olanzapine, so a benzodiazepine and a neuroleptic. They are typically used up to date in clinics for such reactions, and we will assess how well these drugs are able to reverse the LSD response after LSD intake and how they affect the response or the effects of LSD. So, to conclude, um, all three substances showed uh, linear pharmacokinetics with close concentration effect relationships over time. For all three substances, no adjustments to sex are needed. Maybe a, a body weight adjustment needs to be performed for mescaline, but we are not sure about this yet but LSD and psilocybin do not need to be adjusted to body weight. Uh, LSD at a dose of 100 microgram base and psilocybin 20 milligram and 500 milligram mescaline can be considered an equivalent dosage in terms of their subjective but also autonomic effects. We recommend starting with a dosage of 100 microgram of LSD based also um, due to this reported ceiling effects for positive effects at 100 to 150 microgram, but not for those negative effects, and then to further increase the dosage um, if the first dosing was well tolerated. For psilocybin, a starting dosage of 20 to 25 milligram is recommending, uh, recommended with further increases that can be performed up to 30 or 40 milligrams. When using mescaline, the dose-dependent nausea and frequent emesis at higher dosages should be considered and also, of course, the different duration for uh, the effects of these substances with the longest duration of effects for mescaline followed by, psilocybin, uh, followed by LSD and then uh, the short or more or less short-lasting psilocybin. For psilocybin, so um, SSRI or prior SSRI treatment does not to be stopped. 
the dosing on the treatment day is optional. Possibly this also needs to be uh, also do not need to be stopped uh, prior to dosing with LST and mescaline. It's being tested for LST. We do not know this about mescaline yet. And all 5-HD2A antagonists, including neuroleptics and um, it's a certain antidepressants such as trazodone and mirtazapine need to be stopped for all three substances. If you know that the patient or the participant is a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer or is using a strong CYP2D6 inhibitor, um, you should consider the reduction of the dosage of LSD up to 25%. For psilocybin and mescaline up to date, there is no pharmacogenetic information available. So here I like to stop my presentation and in uh, particular thank all of my research group without whose uh, contribution these presentations would not have been possible. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Ah, yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. It was really insightful. Now we still have time for about two to three questions. So there's people around them with the microphone. So just raise your hands and uh, they will come to you. Okay, start it. Hello, thank you very much for this very informative talk, especially for clinician. Uh, in, in your former study, you showed that the people who are double-blinded, they don't know what substance they get. Is that right? And is it the same for mescaline? They just know uh, when it continues to act? Yes, um, that's the case. Uh, it's probably... Um, the one reason that is leading for or unblinding as, uh, the most is the longest duration. But we also assessed blinding at, uh, after three hours after administration, and then it, they almost couldn't distinguish between the substance. But of course, after all the effects subsided, they could know what they got because of the longer treatment duration or subjective effects duration. Thank you. Uh, hi, I, <coughs> I'm somewhat astonished by the dose equivalence. Uh, um, I would not have expected to, to have 500 uh, milligrams of mescaline equivalent to 120 with LSD and psilocybin. And it seems that you are also a bit astonished because you initially started with 300. Uh, do you know if this is corroborated by uh, usage in naturalistic settings, like, you know, on Aravid, for instance? Well, not really, but the doses reported um, were mostly using mescaline sulfate, which would also um, it help us, or which could also explain why these differences were observed. Oh, thank you very much. This is important information. Um, I have a one question and a comment. My question is about, you know, we have reason to believe that the set and setting has a major effect on drug effect. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how to study that in, in healthy volunteers, um, rather than just thinking this is the drug effect. And my comment is, um, I have real concern about this idea of stopping a difficult experience. You know, in the clinical trials, at least with MDMA, we, we get concerned if, if anxiety never comes up. You know, it seems, it appears that it, sometimes having a blissful experience and, can be very helpful, and sometimes having the anxiety come up, if you're prepared to stay with it, can be very helpful. So I have a concern clinically, if somebody's having a very challenging experience during a session, and you give a drug to stop that, my concern is you may have blocked the trajectory of that process that might have led to some deep healing, 
and you also give the message to the person that I don't think you're able to handle this, I don't think this is okay to go into the anxiety, you need to get away from it. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Thank you. Um, challenging experiences have not been related to positive treatments outcome to my knowledge, but I also agree that anx also anxiety is not anxiety and it could be helpful for the process. Um, but we do not recommend to stop anxiety uh, um, at all, but we would rather uh, say that we would start with a lower dose first so that the patient gets experience to this possibly overwhelming ego dissolution um, phenomena and this existential distress this might induce. And so therefore we recommend further increasing the dosage with a second treatment, but not um, to block the anxiety, which could also, of course, be a potentially useful tool for these transdiagnostic processes. We have time for one or two more questions. Thank you very much for this wonderful speech. Um, I was actually keen on um, hearing one or two sentences about the neurological effects for cluster headaches and other mm -hmm. neurological disorders. Um, it's mainly being investigated for cluster headaches and migraine and um, mostly anecdotal reports indicate that those substances could be useful in the treatment for both neurological disorders. And there's one study uh, assessing effects of psilocybin on migraine, which showed quite promising results, but it was only a very uh, small study and um, along a short observation periods and the um, results for cluster headaches were not conclusive in this trial, but there are several trials now investigating migraine and also one ongoing study here assessing effects of LSD and cluster headache patients. But it has been reported in cluster headache patients that it mainly it's not able to, to abort these acute attacks of headache they are experiencing, but it's um, been reported to prolong the remission time between attacks happening or um, these episodes they are experiencing. Yeah, one, one, maybe two, depends on how long the questions are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering how much it could be useful to have the experience of the ego dissolution, how much it's useful to increase the dose of LSD or the dose of psilocybin. I mean, in my experience, it looks like sometimes it's useful to really increase the dose to experience this famous ego dissolution. What is your opinion about that? So, uh, I, I don't understand exactly. You mean if by increasing the How dosage, you can also... How much it's useful to experience the ego dissolution to have higher dose? Mm -hmm. Because in my experience, it's not so easy to experience mm -hmm. this feeling. Yeah, ego dissolution is clearly dose dependent and I, I'd say it also depends on the indications why you are using um, psychedelics and if you want to reduce this ego dissolution. I think it might be helpful more for transformative processes and to experience this um, existential distress as well. So I think it might be useful in those patients, but I'd say it depends on the indication, but it is clearly dose dependent. Thank you for the presentation. I have one question. If, uh, 
if you can say which of these um, uh, psychedelics have the biggest or the, the strongest antidepressant effect for uh, uh, depression resistant to um, I, I cannot tell you. So far, most trials have only been performed with um, psilocybin. There is one study um, that has investigated LSD, which also shows very good results, which hasn't been published yet, but I cannot tell you which substance would be rather beneficial. It looks like both substances are working well. Thank you very much. Well, if there's a short question, I think we can take one more if you're up to it, so. <laughs> Thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, microdosing. Uh, what do you expect uh, to be the results of microdosing with antidepressants, for example? Um, in healthy volunteers, uh, microdosing only showed subtle effects, and so it's not clear whether microdosing really helps in uh, psychiatric disorders. This also hasn't been investigated yet, but there are clinical trials that are po probably going to measure effects of microdosing also on depression or other psychiatric disorders. But so far, it does not seem to have a lot of effect in healthy participants. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you all for your wonderful questions and thank you again, uh, Jasmin Schmidt, for the comprehensive talk.